context of the scriptures. And so um, we'll start. You're good to go? Good. Okay. So um, today we want to focus on New Testament history and uh, just to bring together the various aspects of timing in, uh, in the New Testament. And in preparation for that, I thought maybe it might be helpful for us to read responsibly from the beginning of the first three chapters of the Gospel of Luke. Luke is the writer, the Gospel writer, who does the most with timing and with the events of history as it relates to the world around him. And so you'll see that in these three opening statements of the three chapters. So, if you will, I'll read the white print and you'll join me in reading the yellow this morning. Luke chapter 1, first. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to accomplish, excuse me, to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well having investigated everything <coughs> carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so, so that you may know, know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So that's how the story begins and goes on, as you know, into Zacharias and Elizabeth giving birth to John the Baptist. <coughs> Chapter 2 begins. Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This, this was the, the first, first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. And she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And then chapter 3 begins. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of Etruria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene, in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into the district around the Jordan, <clears throat> preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book with the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So it's just interesting to me that Luke chooses to include all of this political information as he introduces first the birth of John the Baptist, then the birth of Jesus, and now the ministry of John the Baptist and of Jesus. <coughs> so this is our timeline. Uh, we're working on this. Uh, you have it hopefully now written right on the inside of your forehead. So you close your eyes, and that's what you see it is 4,000 Adam. 2400, <coughs> Noah, right? right. So you get, that's what you see. And so you can place yourself wherever you are in the study of God's Word. Last week we looked at this period of time, what we called intertestamental, up until the birth of Jesus. And today we want to look at the New Testament period. And then we'll move on from there into the future. But um, our focus here today. It still all revolves around Abraham and the call of Abraham. We said that as we looked at it. God called Abraham from Ur to Haran and then to Canaan. And uh, the biblical focus centers on the land of Canaan here as Abraham moves to this location. Now, this is where we left off 
at the end of our time together last week. And I thought it would be helpful for us to put this back up, give you a chance to um, interact with that, and maybe you have questions. What we were trying to do last week is to point out what was happening in the land of Israel during this period of time. From really Isaiah 750 all the way down to the time of Jesus. And these were the major world empires. First Assyria, then Babylon, then Persia, then Greece, and finally Rome. And this is what's happening or not happening as the case may be in the rest of the world. So, I don't know if you have questions. Basically, what I was trying to show us, I'll come back to that in a second, was that the Middle East is the very center of, of God's plan. It's the center of known human history, of, of detailed history. And so from 2000, 2400 BC, from the days of Noah, all the way down to the time of Jesus, this is really the focal point of history, both from a secular viewpoint as well as from um, as well as from the um, biblical viewpoint. So, questions, or you have all the answers? There's <laughs> <laughs> kind of no place to go here. Oh. I was just trying to give you a frame of reference, like for Socrates and Plato, okay? They occurred here, Aristotle is after Plato. Uh, Confucius down here. For most of them, the dates are approximate. <coughs> it's not until we get down into this period of time that we start to have fairly firm dates. Um, nobody has an exact date for the birth of, of Socrates, but uh, most people put down the year that he died. And then we start to have more specific, detailed records. It's very interesting to me. Um, how little, how little we know of all of this, because the Bible is really the authoritative source for world history up until and through the time of Jesus. Rob? It's not a question, I think it's an observation that I think is fascinating, that people don't question Plato, Socrates, Homer, and their writings, and was it watered down over the years? But yet, the Bible's different. Like, it's under complete attack. And there's so much more proof about the Bible, like, yeah. word for word. Yeah. But no one questions them. Like, well, that's just deception. Yeah. I mean. yeah. and Why do you suppose that is? <laughs> the devil. Because of the, same. the enemy. Because of the evil one who wants to undermine the authority of God's word, right? So we look to all other kinds of authority in the world around us, and especially people who, um, who are not focused on the Lord, who don't, who don't have faith in Jesus, who have not been born again into God's family, are looking for ways to justify how they want to behave, what they want to do, and so forth. And so um, it's easy to accept these philosophers. The other thing I think about them is, is that as we move through this process, we are moving more and more away from the revelation of God's word, aren't we? The further we come down through the course of history, the more we deviate, the more we move away. That's a general principle, um, and it's sort of recorded for us in Romans chapter 1 when Paul says, all men are responsible because everybody had access at some point, going back historically, to the truth of God that God made himself known, made his, uh, the reality of his existence known, and so on. Can I comment on that? Sure. Um, so you said everybody's made, it was made known, but only in that area, right? Like, you think of uh, the comment, like, all roads lead to Rome, but, like, in North America, South America, Africa, it took. It seems like it took a long time for the word to get to those. Yeah, is that just the, the plan, or uh, it seems you know what I mean? It's like it doesn't seem like there was concentrated efforts on whatever to make that word known yeah. 
right away for some reason. What we see happening in each of these, in Europe, in Africa, China, the Orient, and so forth, is very sketchy history back here, right? Because people are moving out from the center. So the, the Bible, as we saw about three weeks ago, the Bible says that all of the Earth's population come from the three sons, no. three sons of Noah, right? So that means we had this map here uh, that somewhere in here, the ark settles, and Noah and his sons exit the ark. And so the entire Earth's population has to spread from here. And what we're seeing is, is that we do not have really much at all in terms of any accurate authoritative historical records outside of this area and outside of the Bible. But as, as men move from this direction, they also move away from the truth that they took with them. So everybody had access to the truth from their forebears, the sons of Noah, and from what had happened. And everybody had access to um, the, the Word of God, as, as Moses has written the first five books of the Bible, and so that truth is foundational as well. But as they move out, they move away, and even within the local area, as they move on, they move away from the authority of God's Word, because we don't like being under God's authority. Even as people who <coughs> believe in Jesus as our Savior, there are times, right, when we chafe at what the Bible says, and we want to move in a different direction. And so, if we're not believers, then becomes even stronger and greater. Yeah. You think that God was still working in those areas even though it wasn't recorded? And I say that because you think of like Abimelech. There's not a lot of information, but he just shows up. And God was working there. And you also think of like Nineveh. Like, reading Jonah's message to them, something happened before that. Yeah. For them, the whole city to change their minds. And the Lord chose, to, so we don't we don't get the whole story, right. but I gotta believe that God's still working, somehow, some way that we don't know about. And we were just talking on the way over this morning that God spoke to uh, Cyrus, we saw last week, the king of Persia, and raised him up, and He said, "I will have Cyrus do my bidding." And we don't know the extent of that relationship, whether Cyrus was what we would call a born again believer today or not. But he certainly was someone who served God, and God said he's going to do it without money, without <coughs> reward, without payment, because I'm going to work in his life. And so God is working in the lives of people also, even as they move away from, uh, from this center. We don't know, because God hasn't given us the record of everything. And so we have a choice to trust the record that he has given us or not. All right, so let's move on to the New Testament then this morning. Um, I thought it would be helpful for us to think in terms of the Roman emperors. The Roman Empire is in control of the world by this time. The Roman Empire actually begins at 27 BC. The Roman Republic began about 400 years earlier. But Caesar Augustus, uh, his name was actually Octavian, accepted the title Augustus from the Roman Senate. And with that, we mark the beginning of the Roman Empire, 27 BC. And then he's followed by Tiberius, by uh, Caligula, Claudius, Nero, Vespasian. The Temple of Jerusalem is destroyed in 70 AD, as you know. Domitian is the next major emperor, and then Trajan. And so, um, you will memorize these. <laughs> you, you don't need to memorize all of them. Which ones are mentioned in the Bible? Some of them we saw this morning. Tiberius. Caesar Augustus. It says that Caesar Augustus is the one that sent out the decree for the registration and the census in connection with the birth of Jesus. Tiberius is the is the Roman emperor when Jesus begins his ministry in. In Luke chapter 3, it was mentioned there. And then Claudius is mentioned in the New Testament as the one who expelled all the Jews from Rome 
and Priscilla and Aquila then hooked up with the Apostle Paul in Corinth. So those three are mentioned in the New Testament. What's interesting to me is how little they're all mentioned. All right, We have really only passing reference to the three of them in the, in the passages that we looked at this morning and one other one. So um, it's helpful also to understand some of the local leaders, the local government. And so we have Herod the Great, and we're introduced to him in Luke chapter 1. And then we have his son, Archelaus. I couldn't put the whole name in there. <laughs> in that room. And Antipas, his two sons, who receive part of his empire when he dies. And, um, and then they are succeeded in, the, in Judea by a Roman prefect. And the one who's named for us, who's infamous in rejecting in the the rough life of Jesus would be Pontius Pilate. Yeah, so he would be the one. There's no, there's no king during this uh, particular time period actually running Jerusalem and Judea, but we do have kings in other areas. Then Herod Agrippa, uh, who was another son, takes over. Um, we have a procurator in in Galilee. Excuse me, in Judea, Agrippa the second which is a grandson, um, becomes a king uh, for a brief period of time. He actually lives down here to the end of this period of time and uh, was very influential in Roman affairs and so forth. And then um, the Roman legate here who controlled what was left of the city of Jerusalem after it was destroyed. So these are the local leaders. So when it talks about King Herod, it's King Herod under Caesar Augustus. Or when it talks about Agrippa being a king, he's a, he's a king, but he's a down the line kind of king, right? He's a he's a more of a puppet king, and so these are our local leaders in this New Testament age. Now it's helpful also to see where Jesus and some of the disciples fit into the picture. By most accounts, Jesus is born at about four B.C. We use zero, it's just easier. The calendar works that way. But the records are fairly clear that Herod the Great died at about 4 BC. And Jesus was born before he died, right before he died. And we have the story in Matthew chapter 2 about the infant children that were killed by Herod. So in all likelihood, Jesus is born somewhere around 5 BC or 4 BC right before uh, Herod, uh, uh, Herod dies. <coughs> I put Peter uh, as a contemporary of Jesus. It seems to me Peter is probably born about the same time. We don't know for sure. We do know fairly um, accurately that he dies at about 67 or 68 in the persecutions under Nero. So we have Nero here, and Nero comes right down to this area. So uh, Peter lives until that point. James, uh, the brother of John, James of Zebedee, Jesus' cousin, appears to be maybe a couple of years younger than Jesus. And, of course, he is executed by Herod. That would be Herod Agrippa here, who has um, authority over, um, over the territory in those days. And then... Paul comes on the scene, and the best we can tell from the scriptures, Paul would be the same age as Jesus. They would be uh, born at about the same time, and uh, so Paul lives also down here uh, to this point in time. So you have a, a frame of reference in terms of what's going on, New Testament-wise, historically, as we interact with um, with the details of the story. And then the Apostle John, as far as I can tell from Scripture, the Apostle John was probably the youngest. And John is exiled to Patmos over here at about 95 or 96 AD under the, the uh, under Domitian, the Roman Emperor, and uh, that's where he receives the book of Revelation and records that for us and the New Testament ends with Revelation, ends with John's death, fairly close to 100 A.D. 
So that's why we use the date zero to 100 for the New Testament era. All right, questions or comments? Sir John outlived the others there? Yes. So why, why was James, why, his life doesn't seem to be that long? Because he was executed by Herod in Acts chapter 12. Okay. Remember the story, he put, he executed, uh, Herod executed James and then he put Peter in prison. And he was going to execute Peter, and so they were waiting till the holidays were over. But what happened? Angels came. The angel came and brought Peter out of jail in the night. <coughs> and so you read the story there how God intervened. And so you see the hand of God in terms of all of these things: Herod the Great, the birth of Jesus, the life and ministry of the apostles, and so on, as you come through this time. Good. Good question. So, so James had a brother, John. Yes. And they were were they the sons of thunder? Yes. How'd they get that name? Jesus gave it to them. <laughs> <laughs> thunder. Was it something crazy or? Because they were like you. <laughs> <laughs> they were always causing trouble. <laughs> Actually, it came about apparently because on one occasion. James and John came to Jesus, and they said, we saw a man casting out demons in your name, but he wasn't one of us. And so we want to we uh, call down judgment from heaven on him. And Jesus says, you guys, you guys are <laughs> sons of thunder. You guys always want to, to uh, create those kind of things. Yeah. And so a couple of occasions like that, and so Jesus gave them that nickname, sons of thunder. Yeah. Yeah, I got thunder. I get confused. Okay, so Jesus had a brother, James, and a brother, John. Uh, no brother, John. No brother, John. James and John. So the James and John here okay. are Jesus' cousins, okay. first cousins. Sons of Zebedee okay. and Mrs. Zebedee. So the. <laughs> John, then he says he is beloved. Is that John? Yes. Okay. First cousins. Okay. All right. As best we can tell from okay. scripture. Good question. Zebedee was Mary's brother, or his who who was Zebedee he was married to Mary's sister. Oh, okay. The persecution of the church start in the the Tiberius. Caligula and Claudius, or Caligula, Claudius, and Nero, that was cousin, and they Well, it actually started, when it started, it was not Roman. It started because of the Jews. Yeah. Because of what? Of the Jewish people. Uh -huh. The Apostle Paul, before he became Paul, and others here in about 35, 34, 35 AD, started that first persecution. So, so that was Jewish. Okay. The Jewish people were persecuting the Christians. The Roman persecution doesn't start till you get over here. Claudius and especially here. Caligula? Caligula was a was a monster. Well, but, they uh, said that three of them was cousins. I think Caligula, Claudius, and Nero. Uh, they or might Tiberius. have been. They might have been. They're Roman emperors, and they come from the the royal family. And they was cuckoo, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> James, though, this Jesus also had a brother named James. Right. Yes. And that's the one who wrote the book of James. That's right. I heard so I didn't put James's half brother, James, on here. Uh, but he he would be slightly younger than Jesus. And he died by most accounts right about the same time here as Paul and Peter. Um, but we don't have any authoritative word on that. All we have is church tradition. And so it's sometimes hard to deal with church tradition versus, um, of course, the authority of Scripture, which we can uh, afford. Church tradition according to deaths. Church tradition? According to when they die. Yes. But we do know from the biblical record that he is Jesus' brother. Yes, that's correct. Jesus' brother, yep. Okay. James was the one that had the first in Jerusalem, the first, he was the first... Uh, in charge of the church. 
Yes. In the book of Acts, James's half brother Jesus, who was the like the bishop or the overseer of the church in Jerusalem. So you when you have Paul coming up to Jerusalem, he goes to James and the elders. And that would be the James who was the half brother of Jesus who wrote the book of James. Okay? Interesting. Yeah, I thought it was just helpful for us to see the the uh, missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. Um, there are four of them. The first one is the dotted red line to Cyprus up into Galatia and back. The second one is uh, green, I think. No, the second one is the purple. And so the purple, he goes this way through Galatia. And the Spirit of God won't let him go west. <coughs> so he goes north, comes to Troas, and then over into uh, Greece. And you have him going to Philippi and Thessalonica and so forth. And then he returns. The third trip in the same area, except now you he goes believe. across to Corinth. And he spends a lot of time there at Corinth and so on. And then you have the, uh, the uh, travels of Paul in the shipwreck experience out here in the middle of the Mediterranean. And he goes on to Rome. That covers a period of time from about 47 to about 50, about 57, about 10 years he made these three missionary journeys, which is pretty incredible when you think about it. He didn't have planes, he didn't have the modern transportation and so forth, and then you have him in prison down here in Caesarea for two years, and then he goes through the shipwreck and he's imprisoned in Rome for two years. So uh, from about 47 to 62, so about 15 years, four of which were spent in incarceration. And so what Paul accomplishes in that period of time is nothing short of amazing in terms of what's happening. All right, that's a whole other study in itself in terms of going through that. Uh, here's, here's what stands out to me. Paul writes in, in Galatians chapter four, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. <laughs> so what G Paul is saying is that Jesus' birth was at the perfect timing. So perfect timing, you think about what's going on in the Roman Empire, what's going on with these guys, some of whom were were right, right, right. sometimes just not in their right minds and so forth, and yet this is God's perfect timing. There are at least four things that contribute to that being the perfect timing. One is <coughs> Pax Romana. Pax Romana is the peace Latin of, phrase for peace of Rome. the peace of Rome. So the Romans had established their authority over the empire, and peace prevailed. And so you could travel you could move about the empire. In conjunction with that, you mentioned before, Roman roads, <coughs> all right? So we have Via Romana, the roads of Rome. And so not only was there peace, not only could, you, could people travel safely because there wasn't the warfare and everything going on, they also had the means of travel. And then there was also <coughs> the, the lingua franca. That's an expression that's used to mean a universal language. And Greek was the universal language of this whole period for this time. The Greeks had had profound impact over this whole area. All right, Rome, uh, Alexander the Great was back at what date? <coughs> About 330 BC. So the Greeks controlled this whole area from 330 BC all the way down until the Romans took over about 150. And so the Romans absorbed the Greeks and the Greek uh, culture and language and so forth. And so uh, Koine Greek was the language that was spoken in the whole area. That's called the lingua franca, the universal language. And then the fourth thing was the Jewish um, sense of frustration and despair. Because the nation of Israel had had these promises about Messiah who would come. And they blow through these various world empires, and there's still no Messiah. And so the Jewish people are longing for uh, God's uh, preservation and God's provision of a Messiah. 
And so you have this whole situation into which Jesus comes. It's not ideal in terms of a what we would call a Christian emperor, but it is ideal in terms of God's perfect timetable for the, the transition in time. And so um, it's just helpful to think in terms of where the New Testament books fit in here. Um, if I list them out for you, um, most of them are written right in here. Uh, the green is the Apostle Paul. Um, blue are the um, the apostles, and then uh, James uh, fits in here with the general epistles. So what's interesting is that the book of Genesis covers this 2,600 years of history. Remember, we saw that it covers this long period of time from the creation of Adam at 4,000 all the way down to the life of, really, we start with Moses in the book of Exodus. So really 2,600 years, and then 1,000 years for the Old Testament books, the rest of them from Exodus through Malachi, and when you get down here, you have the New Testament written in 50 years. Starting with, with James, is probably the earliest book at about 45 or so, until the book of Revelation, <coughs> about 95, 96, 97, somewhere along in there, that Revelation is written. And so the focal point is, is coming in. What we're doing is we start out with a very broad perspective, and we zero in on the life of Jesus and the ministry in the New Testament. And so it's helpful for us to understand uh, these significant things that are taking place here. We have the mosaic or the law economy that comes down until the death of Jesus. From 1400 BC all the way down until the death of Jesus. And then we have the grace or the spirit economy, I prefer to call it the spirit economy, that starts with the, with the church um, right after the death of Jesus. And so the focus here in the Old Testament is on, the focus here is on Gentiles as God moves to change what he's doing with, uh, with his program for history. And so we come all the way down <clears throat> to the fact that the birth of Jesus is really the pivotal point. And that's why we have B.C. and A.D., Somewhere, a few years after this, the, um, some of the Roman <coughs> church leaders came up with a calendar, and so they started the calendar appropriately with uh, the birth of Jesus. It's all about Jesus, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's where we're going with all of this. We don't know much about what happens with the apostles. Tradition tells us that Matthew went this way, south, that um, Thomas went to India, <coughs> that Thaddeus went to, uh, and, uh, went to Armenia, which is up here in, in the north part of Turkey, and probably somebody went this way as well in Africa. We don't know. And for whatever reason, God has chosen not to give us any authoritative records. There are traditions all over the place about apostles going in different directions. What we do know is that the gospel begins to spread from here and move out into the uttermost parts of the earth. And so we want to wrap up with just a couple of thoughts. First, uh, it's God's redemptive plan that's affected through the life of Jesus in the New Testament, isn't it? Jesus comes, as Paul says, born of a woman, born under the law, that he might redeem those who were enslaved under the law. The spiritual administration is adjusted. And so when Jesus dies on the cross, the temple curtain is torn in two, and we have a whole new administration that's introduced. The Apostle Paul is the one who, who lays that out for us in his epistles. And then thirdly, um, the Gentiles are now included in God's plan. He's going to go back to Israel, but the focus is on Gentiles. And the New Testament says that what Jesus did on the cross was so significant that just Preserving and saving the nation of Israel was not enough reward. And so God said, I'm going to bring millions of Gentiles into the family of God as part of the reward for what Jesus has done. Amen. It's all about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Father, help us as we seek to um, understand and, and reflect on these truths as we appreciate what you have done and what Jesus has done. The sacrifice that he has made 
It's such an awesome thing. We just thank you and praise you. Lord, I pray that you, with the fact that as you were engaged in history back then, in the midst of far from perfect political uh, or cultural circumstances, so you're engaged in our lives, far from perfect political and cultural circumstances. Help us to walk with you and trust you, even as Jesus did, even as the apostles did. It's in Jesus' name that I pray.